it's become far more mainstream than it ever was. I mean, you have podcasts that have now been turned into television shows. You look at um, Wondery's Dirty John, it, they ended up on Bravo and had a really successful run there. We have two dope queens from WNYC and they have a series on HBO that just got picked up for a second season. Uh, and then you have Gimlet, they had a, a fictional podcast homecoming and Julia Roberts was the star of that show and that ended up on Amazon Prime. Welcome to Podcasting Made Easy. I'm your host, Christine O'Donnell, a journalist, podcast producer, and media coach. This podcast is a resource for podcasters that breaks down what it takes to launch a podcast and grow that podcast brand and business. So let's get you started. Today, we have Senior Vice President at Edison Research, Melissa Kisci, joining us on the podcast. She is a key member of not only the audio and media research at Edison, but the Edison election team coverage as well. Today, we are going to dive into the latest podcasting statistics and what they mean for current and soon-to-be podcasters. We'll learn unique market-proven strategies to grow your podcast audience audience, as well as what data is telling us about the future of the podcasting industry. Before we get started, I do want to add a quick disclaimer. Now, in this interview, I forgot to wear headphones while recording, and my audio peaked throughout, which is truly a beginner mistake to not wear headphones. Audio, though it doesn't sound great, it's still airable. It's just not great. And I did use some tools to help fix the issue, and I'm adding them to the show notes. I do want to remind you that my goal is to make podcasting easy and to really simplify it for podcasters and soon-to-be podcasters out there. So I'm going to make mistakes in the process, and I'm going to be completely open about what I did and how you can make sure not to make the mistakes that I've made and your process can be seamless. Thanks again for listening, guys. And without further ado, here's Melissa. Hello, Melissa. Hello. Hello. Thanks for joining me here on the podcast. I So you're from Edison Research, your VP over there. Senior VP, excuse me. Can you tell us a little bit more about what Edison is about, what you guys do there? Sure. Well, I have been at Edison my entire career, 15 years. And some exciting news for our company. We're actually celebrating our 25th anniversary as a company tomorrow. So that's super exciting. There's a lot of buzz in the office about what that means. We're going out for a big Thai dinner and uh, going to one of those cool video game, retro video game places. So um, we're really psyched about that. Uh, but as far as what Edison Research does, we are a full service market research company. And there's tons of market research companies out there. And then really to be successful in this industry is to kind of come up with ways to differentiate yourself and have focus. We started researching broadcast radio 25 years ago, really. Our focus was on you know, terrestrial AM, FM stations, helping markets, helping personalities within those markets. Uh, and we still do a lot of that work, but certainly the audio landscape has changed quite a bit in the last 15 years or so. And so in addition to broadcast radio, we also do research for satellite radio. We do research for smart speakers. We do research uh, for podcasting as well. And podcasting has really become a significant portion of our business. I had a colleague, Tom Webster, who 12 years ago, when everybody said, what's a podcast? And the only way to actually listen to a podcast was to download it from your computer onto your iPod. He said, hey, we need to really start researching this. And so we did. We started researching it. And, and it means that we have a, a tremendous amount of tracking data on podcasting um, you know, over the, last, over the last 12 years or so. Um, but you know, we do all sorts of other research as well. We, we do a lot of international research. We've done research in, in 66 different countries. Um, you know, we are always up for, for unique, crazy logistical challenge type of, type, type of projects. Awesome. Well, that's exciting. I feel like I just got like a real education about what you guys do there. And it's so much more extensive than I, I think had wrapped my head around. What can you tell me about how you guys collect your data when it comes to the podcasting world? 
Okay. So, um, well, as I said, you know, we are a full service market research company. So we do collect data in all different ways. We use quantitative methods, telephone surveys, online surveys, but we also do a lot of qualitative work as well. So we actually will often go out and talk to people about podcasting or other topics. But the main study that we do every year that's kind of our report card for the, the digital media industry is really the infinite dial. And the Infinite Dial is a study that's been around for 21 years now. We celebrated our 20th anniversary last year. We did a, a big fancy webinar where our hosts wore tuxedos. We had a little bit of a red carpet, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but the Infinite Dial, 21 years ago when it, was, when it started, it was a study really about the start of audio on the internet, about internet radio. And we started to see trends in internet audio and as time went on and the study continued, we started adding all sorts of other things. So social media, podcasting, when podcasting started to become popular, we more recently added smart speakers to that list of topics that we cover. And really every year, there are a tremendous number of people in the industry that tune in to understand where the industry stands at that point. And I would say that podcasting as a topic is, is probably the area that garners the most interest. Um, you know, this past year for the Infinite Dial study, when we did our webinar, we actually had clients and companies that, um, you know, set up viewing parties and they, they tweeted about it and they talked about it. There was a couple that actually had bingo boards. So anytime we mentioned a very market researchy type of uh, terminology, they would, they would mark it on their bingo board. Um, so, so that was a lot of fun as well. But would they also anyway. take a shot? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, but podcasting, you know, given its popularity, what we have done over the last few years is we've turned it into its own report. So we have the, the podcast consumer as a separate product. So the infinite dial itself is a nationally representative telephone sample. Uh, we do it to the most rigorous, sta uh, rigorous standards. If you know anything about market research, doing telephone interviewing, it becomes more difficult as the years go on. It becomes more expensive as the years go on. But we also understand that it is the best way to be projectable to the U.S. population. So we continue to do it that way. We do it in English and Spanish. Um, and then we weight all of that data to the U.S. Census so that our population matches what, what Americans actually look like nationwide. Um, this year, we added an additional component, which was an online survey of over 4,000 additional people so that we could dig into additional topics that couldn't be covered within the telephone survey. And our podcast consumer report is really built based on some of this extended data. And in this series, we were able to ask questions to people about why they listen to podcasts, why they don't listen to podcasts, how they discover their podcasts. So a little bit more qualitative style information. Um, and all of that data so that it is, again, projectable to the U.S. population, we actually are able to weight it back to the telephone sample, um, which, which makes it a little bit more, uh, you know, rigorous as, as the telephone sample would be. So roughly how many people do you guys talk to for the survey? So it's 1,500 in the telephone survey and then just over 4,000 in the online survey. So, you know, we're cl closing in on 5,000 or so people. Um, so it's a lot of people, and again, it's nationally representative. So we are really talking to people all over the country. We're not, you know, just talking to people that are interested in podcasting or other types of digital media. Um, and the telephone sample really allows us to reach out to people that don't necessarily even have access to the internet, which is, um, if you do an online survey, you're pretty limited. You're only able to talk to people that can actually get online. Yes, that's true. And I think that if you're online, maybe you don't think about that. And so there, are, there is a world outside of the internet. Yes. It's a very small world, but there is, yes, there is a world outside the internet. There is. What is the latest data that you can share with us regarding the podcasting world? Sure, sure. I mean, I think that for, for the last 10 or so years, we've seen this slow and steady growth when it comes to the industry. And some of the measures that we, we look at on a, on a yearly basis are familiarity with the term podcasting, as well as the percentage of people that have ever listened to a podcast or that are monthly or weekly listeners. Um, so yeah, we've seen one or two percentage growth, uh, percentage growth over the last bunch of years. 
but there was something about this year that internally we were having these conversations and we were really hopeful. There was just a lot of indicators that we thought that we would see more growth than we normally did. Um, and some of those indic indicators were, were data driven, but most of them were just a gut feeling. Um, you know, certainly there is just more media coverage than there ever has been when it comes to podcasting. It's become far more mainstream than it ever was. I mean, you have podcasts that have now been turned into television shows. You look at um, Wondery's Dirty John, it, they ended up on Bravo and had a really successful run there. We have two dope queens from WNYC and they have a series on HBO that just got picked up for a second season. Uh, and then you have Gimlet, they had a, a fictional podcast homecoming and Julia Roberts was the star of that show and that ended up on Amazon Prime. So big names getting involved made us say, okay, you know, something is changing here. We're hoping we're gonna see big, big changes. So we were really thrilled that we saw the biggest percentage increases that we ever have. So this year, as far as familiarity with the term podcasting, we're now seven in 10. So seven in 10 Americans are familiar with the term podcasting. Now I, I should you know, be a little bit careful about telling what that means is that just because someone says they're familiar with the term podcasting, doesn't necessarily mean they know what the heck a podcast is. You know, they, they've heard the term. So there's still a pretty big gap in the percentage of people that say they're familiar with the term and the percentage of people that have ever listened to a podcast. So, you know, we have people that are familiar with the term, but they don't know anything about it. We have people that are familiar with the term and know what podcasting is, but they just haven't been motivated enough to actually try it. Maybe there isn't content that has uh, spoken to them and made them fear that they're going to miss out by not listening to something. And then on top of that, you do have another percentage of people who tried it at some point and they either you know, didn't like it and so they're a lapsed listener or they tried one thing and then they couldn't find additional content that they were happier with. But the really the biggest headliner here is that we are now over 50% of Americans that indicate that they've ever listened to a podcast. And that's a six percentage increase from what we saw in our previous study. And so I said before, two or three percentage increases a year. Now we're up 6%, 51%, you know, saying that they've ever listened to a podcast. That could be one podcast, that could be 10 podcasts, but that still means that this is going into the mainstream. The majority of Americans are actually listening. In addition to that, our other measures have gone up. So monthly podcasting has gone up to just under a third. So 32% of people have indicated that they've listened to a podcast in the last month. And then weekly listening also increasing. Um, weekly listening just going up to... Uh, you know, just under 25%, so 24, 23% that are saying that they've listened in the last week. So there's certainly still a lot of chance for growth here. Um, you know, there's, there are still people that say that there are barriers to them wanting to listen. We've done a lot of qualitative reach, research with people to try to understand why they're not listening to podcasts. And some of the reasons are, 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 are frankly just com completely silly to me. You know, a lot of people say, well, I don't have a podcast app on my phone. Well, in fact, you do have a podcast app on your phone. So it's just a matter of people being educated, people discovering it, and people, you know, figuring out that there's content out there that they absolutely must listen to that's really directly related to them. Yeah. Are there any other things that people say? Do they feel intimidated by podcasting? Do they feel like they don't know what podcasting is? Do they, I feel like, with some people I've spoken to, my parents, <laughs> but also I, I produce podcasts for other people. And one of the things that we are finding is as we launch a podcast, we're also letting people know what a podcast is and how to listen to it while launching it because mm -hmm. there is a little bit of confusion or what do you, what have you guys found? Yeah. It, I mean, absolutely. There, there is certainly still a tech, technological barrier. I mean, fortunately, I think people are getting savvier. You don't necessarily need a podcast app or a client in order to listen to a podcast. There are certainly a big percentage of people who simply click on a link. They go directly to the website of a podcast that they're interested in, or they click on a social media post that directs them to that audio content. 
So, you know, there's certainly more ways to listen to podcasting than via an app. Um, but really, when we talk to people, people are still, for the most part, music listeners. They love music. You know, spoken word content is, is just not as appealing to everybody as we would like it to be. Those of us that listen to spoken word content can't possibly imagine why anyone would not want to get all this awesome, you know, all, all this awesome storytelling and interviewing. But for some people, like, no, I just want to listen to my music. And as you know, trying to license music for a podcast is next to impossible. And the, the financial limitations there are really difficult as well. So, you know, I think that when that changes, when there is an easier way to actually access music for podcasting, and, you know, we've seen Wondery this past year, they now have a relationship with Universal Music Group. And, you know, that will allow them to foray a little bit more into music, but that's going to bring a lot more listeners in. So there's kind of a, I would say a cap right now on the percentage of people who would even consider ever listening to a podcast. But perhaps if music becomes more accessible, then all of a sudden there's going to be a whole, um, you know, additional group of people that would consider giving it a try. Um, you know, some of the other things that we see are the educational content. So you look at the top 100 list of, of podcasts in Apple, and many of them come from this public radio style storytelling. It's kind of highbrow. It's, you know, podcasting in general, the, the percentage of people that are listening to podcasting tend to be higher education, um, higher income. And so the type of content that's available tends to skew educational. And people tell us, I don't want to be educated when I'm being entertained, you know? So there is a, a certain percentage that say, yeah, I listen to podcasts because it makes me smarter. And on the other side, there's plenty of people say, I don't want to be smarter. I just, I just want, you know, lowbrow, entertainment, gossip, comedy, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good point. We should add some lowbrow content to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't <laughs> I don't know if you can do it. You're too too classy, too classy for this now. <laughs> so is there something based on the data we were just talking about, if you have a brand or if you have a business, based mm -hmm. on the data that you're now finding, it, do you think it would be wise for more businesses or brands to start podcasting? Mm -hmm. And if so, what would be the benefits in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is a good time to start a podcast. I think that, you know, one of the great things about podcasting is that there's a pretty low barrier to entry here. Uh, I mean, pretty much anybody with a microphone and a, and a computer can start a podcast. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a fantastic podcast, but they can at least start a podcast. Um, you know, I, I think that if you are, are trying to start a podcast, you really need to understand the audience that you're trying to reach. If you're an expert in your field and you're trying to reach out to a certain group of people, you need to understand the content that's important to them. You need to be able to put together a series of episodes that's actually gonna be relevant to them. Um, so yes, I mean, anyone can, can start a podcast and there certainly is a lot of room for growth here, but that comes with a responsibility to, to your listeners to actually develop great content. You know, when people ask me, how do you grow your content? How do you grow your audience? I always say it's about the content. You need to be producing something that's high value, that's audience centered mm -hmm. for it to go somewhere. If I could add something to that too, I think that the other thing too is, is looking at a production schedule and committing to that production schedule. Mm -hmm. if, if you want people to buy into you and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to listen every week or every other week. And then all of a sudden you decide to take six weeks off because you can't come up with something, you're going to lose that audience. So you need to really you know, understand ahead of time, what is the commitment I can actually make to this um, so that I don't, don't lose audience and I, I have a bunch of people that can actually trust me. Um, that's a great point. And you know, do you have any other thoughts when it comes to any businesses or brands who are looking to grow their audience, something that they can do to try and succeed at that? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, people that are looking to grow their business through advertising, there's a bunch of different ways to, to touch podcasting. And I mean, the obvious way is really through traditional advertising on podcasting. 
So we know that traditional podcast advertising is successful. You know, find a podcast that has an audience that you are looking to reach and, and buy advertising on that podcast. Um, you know, these host read podcast ads are really what podcasts starting at, started as being able to give a host your advertising content and allowing them to really put their spin on it to make it native to the content that's already created as part of that podcast. That messaging is really powerful. We know that podcast listeners are a captive audience. They're, they're not very likely to skip ahead. These are people that are actually going to sit and listen to that podcast. They've developed a relationship with the host. They are actually likely to at least consider purchasing that product or service. So, you know, the, these host read ads are, are really powerful stuff. In addition, there are these digitally inserted options as well that are kind of just plopped into to different podcasts based on, based on the, the market that you're looking to reach. In addition to that, there are branded podcasts and there are some really phenomenal companies out there that will work with you to create a podcast that's specific to the message that you're trying to get out to your audience. Um, and these companies, the benefit of going with the company that creates a branded podcast is that they're going to have the same production values, the, state, the same storytelling that there's an expectation for um, that we see in that top 100 list of podcasts. So going with a company like that is going to, to give you maybe a little bit more of an edge than if you're trying to do it on your own. And we've seen, you know, we've seen a lot of research here. We've seen, we do a lot of these brand lift studies that prove that, that advertising on podcasting works. We know advertising works all over the place and it still works in, in podcasting. The brand lift studies that we run, what we do is prior to the start of an ad campaign, we will interview listeners about their perspective and their awareness of a product and the products that are competitors to them in that category. Then the uh, six or eight week campaign will run on that, that podcast. And then we go back in the field and we ask a similar set of questions. And that really allows us to look at the lift between the awareness, the unaided or aided awareness, um, the likelihood that someone's going to recommend that product or service to someone else, the likelihood that they're going to consider looking into that service or purchasing it. Um, and over and over again, if a product or service is well matched with a particular podcast or a network of podcasts, these campaigns are, are, are super successful. Um, and, you know, when it comes to branded podcasts, I can think of a couple of excellent examples. There was a podcast a couple of years ago from GE called The Message. And so this was a, a branded podcast from GE. And the way they took it was that they really let the company completely come up with this sci-fi, this totally fictionalized podcast. And while they had a few mentions of GE products and kind of their, their core values within the context of the podcast, it was really just a sponsored podcast um, that, that, that had very minimal mention. And then on the opposite end, you have a podcast called DTR, and that was one that was put out by Gimlet Creative, and uh, that was a podcast that was by Tinder. Took me a second there. I haven't uh, actually had to use a dating app in a very long time. So yes, Tinder came out with DTR, and what was different there is that- What does they DTR have, stand for? So it's define the relationship. Okay. <laughs> You know, your text messaging with your soon-to-be sweetheart, and you're not sure where you stand, you type DTR, and that's the, uh, the moment in your relationship where, you know, are you going steady? <laughs> what so, are we? <laughs> <laughs> so, but get, you know, DTR, what was different about what they were doing is that they were mentioning their brand over and over again. They were using research that they had from their brand and how, and how people were actually using their app. And so, you know, they took a totally different approach, but both were both, both were really successful. Beyond that, you can, of course, create your own podcast. We talked about it before. It really doesn't take a lot. There's very limited barriers to entry here. Um, and oftentimes, you are the expert. There's no one that's going to be able to talk to your audience better than you on the topics that you're trying to get out. And so if you have a passion for it or someone on your team has a passion for it and the talent for it, and the time for it, uh, certainly going and doing your own podcast can be a way to go as well. 
something that I have found just through my time working in podcasts or working with other podcasters is that the podcast listener tends to be the most engaged listener that I've seen just in the marketing world when it comes to how long people will listen to a video sales letter or how long people might listen or how many people might open an email um, and you know follow through when it comes to that call to action when someone asks them to do something mm -hmm. people tend to respond more to podcasters have you found that or have you seen that or have any data about that yeah i mean we we, we see it in the data so we ask a question about you know how often do you skip an ad and it's really very rare that people are are skipping an ad we know that people are, you know, the vast majority of people are listening to the end of a podcast, you know, including all the way through the credits at the end. And people, when they download a podcast, when they commit to listening to something, they are, the majority of people are actually listening within 48 hours. So this is a committed group of people. If, if they like the content, they want to listen to the whole thing. They want to listen to what the host says. They, they want to be engaged with them as much as possible. Yeah, I think that it is that one-on-one -on -one connection um, people are making with the person that they're listening to, which is really wonderful. I, I think that what you said there is, to me, one of the most compelling things about podcasting is the relationship that these hosts can create with their listeners. Um, it, it goes beyond this, this listener-host relationship and, and can often become this, this friendship, this person that you can really count on. There was an episode of Reply All a, a number of weeks ago, and Reply All is a, is a podcast about all things in the internet. And the two hosts have been working together for a really long time. They have a tremendous following, people that um, follow them on social media and listen to all of their episodes. But what they did is they opened their cell phone for a 24-hour period and, and told their listeners that they could call in to talk to the two of them about absolutely anything, which... Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine, but you know, great for them and certainly a way to engage their listeners. And for 24 hours, they switched on and off. You know, one of them slept and the other one answered the phone. And while there were plenty of listeners that were calling in to comment on their fandom for their show and how much they love PJ and Alex, there was also a number of people who called in with really personal stories you know, things that were challenging them in their life, things that they were, um, you know, struggling with, that they needed advice on. And PJ and Alex, they both took the time to, to talk with these people to understand, you know, what was going on with their life. And, and in many cases, tried to actually help them outside of the show, reach whatever goal or, or overcome whatever obstacle they were trying to overcome. And I think that's just an amazing, amazing example of how a podcast, how uh, impactful it can be even outside of the, the regular content that it's producing. Um, another really small example I think of is Radiolab. So every week on Radiolab at the end of the episode, they read the names of all of the people that work on the show. And sometimes the people that read it are people that are somehow involved in the show. Maybe they were a guest on the show. But oftentimes, these are just listeners that call into Radiolab's voicemail and read the names of everybody that works on the show and what their positions are for no other reason than to somehow be involved with that show. And so, again, just totally compelling to me that, that, these, that these types of people, that these kinds of relationships can, can exist within the podcasting community. The creativity that comes with these ideas to connect with their audience that these hosts have is just, I feel like I said that kind of backwards, but I mean, it's, it's inspiring. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do you have any thoughts for people who are thinking about starting a podcast and mm -hmm. might feel like, gosh, this is going to be really hard. How do I do this? This is going to like take so much of my time. This will, I mean, how will I ever grow to have a connection like those, you know, people on Reply All or Radio Lab? Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts uh, to share? I mean, I think it's about keeping it slow. Just because you have an idea for a podcast doesn't mean that you immediately have to create 25 episodes with great content. You know, you can spend a year or more starting to bank some of that content 
and you know work on your delivery and work on your presentation and work on the types of guests that you're able to bring onto the show, I don't think there has to be a tremendous amount of pressure to immediately get out into the marketplace. You should feel comfortable with what you're doing. Um, and then again, you know, as we talked about before, there's always an opportunity to reach out to people that are involved in this field. There's plenty of people that work in a freelance capacity that can offer additional support, whether it be editing or um, music help or helping with scripting or booking guests. There are ways to, you know, without blowing the budget, reach out to people to help produce your podcast without it being overwhelming as an individual. Yeah. Because it might seem that way at first, but I think the more you learn, the more time you spend um, just trying to figure out the industry, the more you realize how easy it can be to just take it one step at a time, record an episode here, record an episode there, uh, listen to it back, check and see if you like it, Let's have your friends listen to it. You can send it out to people and they'll critique it for you and send it back. And there's just so much to learn and grow. And something that I have found is you can learn and grow through the process. You can start podcasting and ask your audience what they want so everyone who's listening, if you want something different from me, <laughs> or if you're looking for something else, or if you have any questions or specific things that you would like me to talk about, mm -hmm. please share them with me. There's a survey attached to the show notes, and I'd love to learn more. So you can learn more from your audience through the process of podcasting, and you don't have to be scared of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there might be some people who don't say nice things out there on the internet mm -hmm. right because there always are but that's not something to to define you or your podcast absolutely you know it's funny this morning i was listening to science versus and the host of science versus one of the things i admire about her is when she first started her podcast she had her parents actually listening to the podcast to give her editing notes and even though she's become tremendously successful since then and she's been picked up you know, by Gimlet and, and, you know, she's now working in the United States, she still credits her parents in every single episode. She still sends her episode for, you know, the stamp of approval from, from mom and dad, um, which I just think is like totally endearing about her. Um, and she said on the episode this morning, she was talking about the, the ratings on iTunes and she actually read aloud some of the negative comments, which I thought was really brave of her. Um, but she basically said, you know, we want to hear your feedback. We want you to tell us where, you know, where we might be taking a misstep and where we might be able to get better. So I think that looking at the negative in, in just the same kind of light that you look at the positive is going to help you grow for sure. Absolutely. That is great, Melissa. Thanks for sharing. Sure. Um, so tell me a little bit about moms and media and research moms. Mm -hmm. I'm a mom. You're a mom. <laughs> I'm sure that there are going to be moms who are listening to this episode. And what, what can you tell us about what, what that is? Sure. So, so Moms in Media has been around for ooh, maybe eight to 10 years or so. And that was a colleague of mine, Melissa DeCesar. She was the first person in my office to become a mom. And when we did our infinite dial study, we looked at the, the mom's cross tab and said, hey, there's really some interesting information here. You know, moms are a little bit different in the way that they consume media and what their behaviors surrounding technology are. And so she, every Thursday before Mother's Day every year, does a webinar called Moms in Media and, um, and really is able to, to talk about some of the trends with moms in her webinar. As far as the research moms go, Six years ago, there was a baby boom at Edison Research, and I think maybe six of us had maternity leaves within a six-month period of time, um, our poor bosses, but, you know, it was an awesome time because we were all pregnant around the same time, so we were all able to talk about the, the craziness and the challenges of that, and, and now we are continuing to support each other through these early years of motherhood, which is amazing. That is awesome. Gosh, I feel like I overshare mom stuff all of the time with my coworkers and they're men. So yeah. it's wonderful that you have women who are also going through it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so 
when five or six years ago, when the research moms started, the reason why we started the research moms is because we kept having these conversations about all the data that we would come out with and how it could be different when we were looking at it from the, the lens of being a mom. And so it's a subgroup of Edison Research. It's the moms at Edison Research and we're able to have the expertise, the market research expertise that we have, qualitative, quantitative, and all of that, but also have the perspective of, of being moms ourselves. And so we have a lot of fun clients. We, we, we certainly work with brands and, and other companies to help give them a spin on mom's research. Um, but we also try to do a study internally every year that we do a webinar on. This past year, we did a study called Moms on the Mother Load. And this was a look at mom's mental load. So there's been all sorts of internet fodder and, and back and forth articles about all of the tasks that mom is responsible for that maybe dad isn't necessarily responsible for. This invisible task list, the making of the doctor's appointments and the remembering of the birthdays and the filling out of the forms for you know, the field trip that's the next day. So we did a survey and we, we talked to parents in general about where their responsibilities lie. And so it was nice because we were able to put some data behind a lot of this kind of generalized talk that was happening on the internet that really said that, yeah, mom is doing the vast majority of these tasks and she's not always getting the appreciation for it. Um, you know, what was unique about it is that moms didn't necessarily mind that, you know, that may be the case, but they kind of just felt that it's, it's part of what they do and they weren't necessarily um, sad or mad about, about having that additional responsibility. Um, and then beyond that, we are actually currently in the process of working on a questionnaire that's going to be a moms and uh, social media study. So we're looking at how moms use social media maybe differently than the rest of the population does. We often talk here at Edison about places like Facebook and, and you'll find as your, as your child gets older, that if you want to know what's happening in the PTA or a mom's group or, you know, anything that any kind of activity that your child is involved in, then you need to be on Facebook, whether you want it or not, because the only way you're going to get that information is via the PTA Facebook group or the, the preschool Facebook group. Um, so we're, we're really interested to see the results that come out from that. Interesting. So, okay, moms are amazing. I don't know how... I feel like there's a part of me that woke up that I didn't even know existed mm -hmm. once I became a mom because, and you know what? I always forget thank you cards. That's, that's the one thing that always falls off my list of like my invisible task list. Yep. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to moms and digital media, social media, it, do you feel that moms are listening to podcasts? Yeah, I mean, moms are definitely listening to podcasts. Moms are mobile. You know, they, they, they're they using their smartphone probably more than any other demographic. There's a tremendous amount of, of planning that goes into every single day when it comes to being a mom. And moms are really on the go. They're dropping their kids off at daycare in the morning. They're picking them up. They're taking them to soccer practice. But they still need to get that invisible task list done. And so, you know, maybe they're waiting for their kids' soccer games to end. They're listening to a podcast. In addition to listening to a podcast, they're ordering school clothes for the semester. Then they're, you know, answering a phone, answering a text message to confirm a doctor's appointment for the next day. I mean, moms are the ultimate multitasker. There's certainly no, no doubt about that. I mean, my husband, I completely love him, but he's a, a one one thing at a time kind of guy. You know, he, can't, he can't always multitask like that. And that's just every day, all day for me and, and many other moms. Do you think that gives moms a upper hand when it comes to perhaps starting a podcast, growing a business and a brand? I mean, I think it's very similar to the, the, the type of content that we see on the internet with moms in the blogosphere, right? So there's tons of blogs that are dedicated to moms and uh, the types of tasks that moms tend to be responsible for, cooking and, and decorating and, and you know, lifestyle type of blogs. Like, there's just tons and tons of them out there. And so I think that content lends itself to, to podcasting in a very similar way. So I can see as people get more comfortable with the idea of creating that kind of content, that that's kind of a natural step for someone that's already putting content out there, maybe in a blog format. Yeah. Um, do you feel that the world is too saturated, the podcasting world? I think a lot of people are like, there's just so many podcasts out there. 
should I be starting a podcast? Like, will it hit? Will it resonate? Listen, there are absolutely crazy numbers of podcasts out there, probably hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there. Um, and yes, I think that there is, there is sometimes a difficulty in trying to, to, you know, make it to that top 100 list. But I think that you just need to know who you're looking to reach. You know, if you're looking to, to be on the top 100 podcast list, doing it on your own is probably not necessarily going to get you there at this point. You know, partnering with a company or pitching your idea to a company that already has some credibility in the space is more likely to be the way that you're going to get there. Um, but I think you just have to keep your expectations in check. You know, if you're writing a blog right now and you reach 100 people through that blog and then you do a podcast and you can get to 150 or 200 people, that's still a success in trying to build your business. Um, you're reaching more people. Again, podcasting is mobile. So people can't necessarily read a blog when they're driving in their car or, or commuting, but they're able to listen to a podcast and, and take in information in a different way than they would. You know, there's a number of different ways to podcast and make money. Do you feel that there's something that, is there a barrier that stops people from doing that? Or, or are, there, are there ways, in your opinion, to podcast and make money? Are there different strategies? Well, I mean, there are a couple of different models that, that exist currently within the industry. The first is this ad-supported style, and, and that's probably the most traditional way and, and the way that people are mo making the most money. And, you know, the best way to monetize there is, again, to go back and understand your actual audience. You, you may think you know who you're talking to, but one of the things we do here at Edison is we help networks and podcasts understand who their listeners actually are. And so we will often do these network-wide or podcast-wide uh, wide studies to understand what percentage of their listenership is female, what percentage of their listenership is interested in buying X kind of product. Um, so that all of that information makes it so that when you go and make an appeal to a particular advertiser, you have a little bit more in your tool belt, a little bit more to say about who that advertiser is actually going to reach if they advertise on your podcast. You know, I mean, as far as other models go, many other people kind of go this Patreon or Patreon route, which is really when the listeners are the ones that are supporting the podcast. And there are many examples of, of success here. And it doesn't necessarily mean that someone can't listen to the podcast if they're not supporting, but those most voracious listeners are willing to pony up $3, $5 a month or you know, $25 a year in order to continue to have access to the content that they've grown accustomed to getting on a weekly basis or a, a monthly basis. So certainly that's a way that, that people have, have found to do it. And then in addition to that, there is this, this new frontier, this new completely paywalled version of podcasting. Luminary launched about a month or so ago. And the only way to access that content is to actually pay a monthly fee. And you know, so if, if you have content that is compelling enough, a show that is going to be successful enough or unique enough, and you can get behind one of these paywalled options, then, then there's more of a direct means of, of making, making income that's not dependent on your listeners or advertisers. I feel Luminary is kind of something that in the podcasting world, a lot of podcasters, um, media hosting companies, people who have been in the business are wondering if it will work. Mm -hmm. Because podcast has been, you know, free content for listeners for so long, and there are so many amazing podcasts that don't have a paywall. Mm -hmm. So, are you kind of looking at this and wondering how will the pieces fall? Yeah, I mean, it remains to be seen if if it will work. And I think you're right. I think that there is there is awesome content that's free. But if you look at it in the, the Netflix kind of story, right, no one ever really thought that they would pay for content that they could get for free, right? They're, they're, they were getting great content on, on broadcast television, and then maybe they were paying for cable, and they said, there's no way people are going to then pay on top of that for something like Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu. And yet, you know, the penetration of Netflix is crazy high right now. All it takes is content that people fear that they're going to miss out on unless they pay for it. And so assuming Luminary follows that model or, or anybody else that's like Luminary, if they give us content that we feel like we can't get anywhere else, 
that is compelling enough, then people are going to be willing to pay for it. Um, you know, I think people don't like to admit that until there is actually the content that they want that they can't miss out on. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not as not familiar enough yet with the, the content that Luminary has is presenting to know personally if, if I'm going to fall into that category. But, you know, I have Netflix, I have Hulu, I have Amazon Prime, I have DirecTV, I have all of those things, and I never thought I would have all of those things. But there's enough content on each of those platforms that it just felt like a, a need for me. Yeah. It's interesting to hear you say it that way. I agree with you um, because I am like, oh, I need to watch Handmaid's Tale, but that's on this one. Or there's one on HBO that I really want to watch. And then- Not Game of Thrones? Oh, well, Game of Thrones, but there's a new one. There's a new one that, yeah, Game of Thrones on HBO, where it's like, you can't miss out on this. You need the subscription. To- exactly. Yeah. FOMO is a very powerful so, thing, so. Yeah, and so that's so interesting. Um, I think some are also worried that if this succeeds, will it? what will it mean for the rest of the podcasting industry? And will there be a paywall then for all podcasts? And it's not I, the, the answer to that is no. Again, if you use TV as the example here, there is still free broadcast television. There is still cable. There are still multiple models that exist. And as far as video content is concerned, you know, TV isn't the only way to access video content. You have YouTube. You have you know all sorts of other places. So I think that multiple revenue models can exist within the podcast ecosystem without saying like there can only be one winner. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when it comes to also, you know, making money through your podcast, I think there's other ways when it comes to if you want to sell a product, uh, whether it's an info product, like a course, or if you're actually you know, selling t-shirts or uh, crock pots, or, you know, there, there's different, different things out there that, it, that podcasting can, can spread the word about. And maybe that could also lead to sales for your business or your brand. Mm-hmm. So Mm -hmm. is there anything else you feel I missed that you'd like to share with the audience? Oh, what else can I talk about? So I think that one of the other things that is important to think about when it comes to podcasting is how important smart speakers are. So that's another study that we do each year with our partners at NPR. And, you know, people want to listen to podcasts on smart speakers and and those that are podcast listeners are doing about 10% or so of their listening on that platform, but they want to be able to do more. If you've ever tried to listen to a podcast on a smart speaker, it's, it's not easy. You know, you can ask for a podcast and it will serve you something from that podcast, but it's hard to navigate to a particular episode. It's certainly not easy to pick up where you left off on maybe a podcast that you were listening to previously in your car or um, elsewhere in your home. So there are still some challenges here for the industry to figure out Uh, A, how to make these skills that are going to make it actually easier, a little bit more frictionless for people to listen to podcasts on smart speakers, and then B, some education, you know, to actually on your podcast, talk to people about how they can access you on a smart speaker. Um, Smart speakers are right now, that's what they are. They're these, these little speakers that can exist in certain parts of your room, but really everything is going to move towards voice activated. And you're going to be able to listen to podcasts and other types of audio content anywhere within your household, you know, on the street, um, you know, in your office, in your car, you're going to be able to access this content wherever. And so making it easy for people to do that and and educating people on, on, on what to say to access that information is really going to be key. Got it. So how do we do that? How do we get a podcast onto a smart speaker? You know, I don't know the technical answer to that question. I mean, right now, a lot of podcasts will play through iHeartRadio, um, which is already exists on there. So if, you're, if your podcast is part of iHeartRadio, you can do that. You can certainly set up a skill that will specifically link you that way. And then you can tell your, your listeners to ask for your specific podcast. Um, but I am not savvy enough to know the details actually how to do that. Yeah, I I know as much as you do at this point. Um, mm-hmm. I know that some media hosting companies are taking care of that for others. Um, mm-hmm. They're expediting the process, but of course, there's a little bit more you have to pay depending on which media hosting yeah. company you choose. Thank you so much for your time, Melissa. 
Absolutely. I'm so happy to have been given the opportunity to speak with you today. Is there any information that you would like to share with the audience? If anybody is looking for help when it comes to research, you can always go to www.edisonresearch.com. You can reach me, Melissa K at edisonresearch.com and always happy to talk to you about what kind of research, um, what kind of custom research we can do to you to help help uh, propel you to the next stage. Well, Melissa, thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening to Podcasting Made Easy. I'd love to learn more about you. What topic would you like me to cover? Who would you like me to interview? Please fill out the survey in the show notes so that I can serve you best. If you're listening on iTunes, remember to subscribe, rate, and review. You can also find me on Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Please share this podcast with your friends, especially if you think they should be podcasting. If you have any other questions or suggestions, you can email me at hello at podcastingmadeeasy.com. You can also find me on social media at the Christine OD. Thanks for listening and have a great day. Thank you.